In the beginning, God created man. Created the perfect man and put him in a perfect place. The Garden of Eden. In the beginning, God created the perfect man and put him in a perfect place. Man had a perfect relationship with God. If you can, in your mind, try to go back. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Try to go back to that scene where man had perfect unity with God. God had created man, and the Bible indicates to us that the relationship that they had, even in the garden, was one of unity. Where God was there in their midst, God spoke to them. God walked among them. The relationship that they had is something that, that, is, that is almost something that we cannot imagine. How glorious and marvelous it must have been for man to have that kind of unity with God. God's desire is for us to have that kind of unity with Him. God created man to be united with Him. He did not create man in order that we might be distant from Him. We are set apart from all of God's creation. More than any, anything else that God created. We have been made in the image of God. We have been designed to have unity with God. So this morning I want us to reflect upon just two points this morning. To reflect upon the second place that we'll talk about this morning. The unity that God wants us to have with Him. But then also as we begin this morning to recognize that the separation that man, that, that man has today is something that has been self-inflicted. I want you to think about that time. Go back to the Garden of Eden and think about God creating man, about God putting him in that perfect environment. And yet, think about what transpired after that. I want, I want you to get your Bibles out this morning, if you will, and turn to the book of Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and the design of a lesson this morning is for us to just park right here in this chapter. And so if you like to turn to a passage and, and, to, and to see where, where the lesson is going to come from during a, during a sermon or a, a class, here, here is, here's the lesson for us this morning. It's right here in Ephesians 2, and so if you want to get your Bibles, if you want to get your mobile devices and, uh, and turn over there, uh, we're going to spend our time this morning trying to investigate what God would have us to know about unity and the unity that we can have with him. But the first thing that we learn from this chapter in Ephesians chapter 2 is that man is in a state of separation from God. And that state of separation that man has away from God is something that is totally self-inflicted. As you turn to Ephesians chapter 2, we begin to see man's deplorable condition. You begin reading in the very first word in the very first verse. You made he, he made alive who were dead in trespasses in sin, who walked once according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. We exist when we live in sin, when we commit sin. The Bible says, and that's the word trespasses here, the Bible says that because of our sin, we exist in a state of, that, that is completely deplorable. Now, notice, notice how this is described for us. What does it mean that we are dead in our trespasses? What does it mean that we are in a state of separation? Drop down to verse 12. Try, try, to, try to take in every description that God gives to us of this deplorable condition beginning down in verse 12. That at that time, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. 
we hear aliens today and we think, well, what did they find on Mars? Flowing water and now we have aliens. You know, we, that's, that's what we think of as we think of outer space. But the word aliens here indicates someone who, who is separate from, someone who, has, who, is, who is not a part of, and this is talking about the relationship with God, you're an alien from God. You have alienated yourself. You have estranged yourself from God. At the beginning of this verse, it said that you are without Christ. You know, there's a lot of things in this life that we might be able to be without and get by without. We can't get by. We can't get by without Christ. But look at the rest of the verse. You are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth, strangers of the covenants of the promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Think about every single one of these words. We're aliened. When we live in sin, when we allow our sinful condition to separate us from God, the Bible says that we have alienated ourselves, estranged ourselves from God. What does that mean? It means that we are without Christ. It means that we are without God. It means that we are in the world. Drop down to verse 13. But now, Christ, now in Christ, you who once were where? Where were you? You weren't close, you weren't near, you weren't almost there, you were far off. When we live in sin, when we commit sin, we are dead in our sin. We are dead in our trespasses. A self-inflicted, deplorable condition that the Bible says in verse 12, we have no hope. And you drop down to verse 16, where it says that we are the enemies of God. You put all of that together, and you begin to see a miserable condition of sin. Who would say that they want any of these things? When, when you look at this list, could you say, well, you know, maybe, maybe this one would be okay. I look at this, and I, no, I don't want that, I don't want that, but maybe I could live with this, but there's nothing that is on this list that we can live with. And yet, and yet when we sin against God, this is where we are. When we turn our back on the commandments of God, this is where we are. And Paul wrote this. He did not write this letter to a group of non-Christians. He wrote this letter to a group of Christians. And you saw the words in verses 1 and 2 and 3 where he says, You were once here, you were once here, you were once here. And it is something for us, even as Christians, to remember where we once were. And to be reminded of that condition where we at one time were without Christ. We at one time were without God. We at one time were the enemies of God. A deplorable condition that was self-inflicted for sure because man is the one who is directly culpable for what he did. Can you imagine a man shaking his finger at God and saying, God, this sin problem is all your fault. Can you imagine someone on the day of judgment walking up to God and saying, God, if you hadn't made me sin, I wouldn't be in this situation today. No, it's not God's fault. The choices that we make, decisions that we make to step away from and step aside and step over sometimes the will of God, totally on us. And so when man finds himself in a state of separation, it is a state that is completely deplorable. It is a state that man is fully himself culpable. He is the one who is to be blamed. And so in that condition, what would you say is man's deepest cry? At that moment, go back to the Garden of Eden. And at that moment, what should have been Adam and Eve's deepest cry? Go back, as we were taken there this morning, to the cross of Jesus. Go back to that scene where there are individuals crying out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! What should have been 
in their deplorable state of separation what should have been their deepest cry. Should it not have been crying out, Oh God. Should it not have been crying out, God, I need to be unified with you. You know, we think about salvation. We think about our relationship with God, and maybe the word unity is not the word that immediately comes to our mind. But is there anything that we need more than to have an end made to the enmity that we can have with God? I don't know if you have any enemies. You know, sometimes it's hard for some of us to think, who, who would I say is my enemy, my personal enemy? You know, we, ha we have enemies as a nation. You know, we, we, we have enemies as, as, as Christians. There are those who have set themselves out as our enemies. Not that we have, not that we have called them to be our enemies, but they have set themselves out in, in, that, in that way. Bible says that when we give ourselves over to sin, we become, we become an enemy of God. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that when Adam and Eve sinned, God did not say, well, so much for man. So much for man, he's doomed. There's nothing that can be done for him. Aren't you glad that there is a God in heaven that when you sin, that he doesn't say, well, I gave him a chance. I thought maybe he might make it. I thought maybe she would do okay, but there she goes. There he goes. Well, oh, well, never mind. Aren't you glad that we serve a God, that we serve a God who wants to have unity with us? That's that's just an amazing thought. To think that the God of heaven can have unity with anyone and anything that he wants. And yet God wants to have unity with you. Not that God wants to have unity with all of man, that's true. Not just that God wants to have unity with the church, that's true. God wants to have unity with you. Do you want to have unity with God? Is there any greater driving force that we ought to have in our life than that we can be united with the God of heaven? As you think about that, I want you to go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and look, look in this passage and look in verse 4 where the Bible talks about the riches of God. How rich do you think God is? It talks about the riches of God in verse 4, where it talks about God who is rich in mercy. And what I want us to see in Ephesians chapter 2 is that God makes us a rich offer. Have you ever had somebody make you an offer? You ever had somebody come along and make to you an offer that was maybe too good to be true? You ever had somebody call you on the phone? Make you an offer and you said, this is too good to be, there's got to be a catch. There's got to be something to this. This just can't be right. Did your parents ever tell you if it's too good to be true, it really is? You know, I mean, that's, God is making you an offer. And it's a rich offer because it's an offer that comes out of his love and his desire to save us. Look down at verse 13. Here is what his offer is. But now... In Christ Jesus. If you study, if you have studied the book of Ephesians, you know that that phrase is the key to this book. The key to the book of Ephesians is being in Christ. And notice that this is the key to this offer that God is making to us. That God's offer to us is that he wants to save us in Christ. Go back up to verse 5. And I want, you to, I want you to notice how many times we're going to see that expression. What does it mean to be saved in Christ? Look in verse 5. When we were dead in trespasses, God made us alive. What do you have after that? He made us alive together with Christ. What does it mean to be saved in Christ? 
It means that you've been made alive. And not just made alive on your own. It means that you have been made alive, notice the word, together with Christ. God does not save you in isolation somewhere. God saves you together with Christ. Drop down to verse 6 and you'll see the same word again. He raised us up together with Christ. Do you remember the day that you were baptized into Christ? Where the Bible says in passages like Romans chapter 6 that you were raised with Christ. Colossians chapter 2, raised with Christ. Now Ephesians chapter 2. You were raised with Christ. God has an offer for you. And the offer is He wants to be united with you. And in order to be united with you, He wants to save you in Christ. By doing what? By making you alive together with Christ. By raising you up together with Christ. Look in verse 6 again. Not only raised us up together with Christ, but He made us to sit together in the heavenly places. Where? What are the last three words you have in verse 6? In Christ Jesus. We cannot be saved apart from Christ. We cannot be saved outside of Christ. God's offer for you this morning is unity. God's offer for you this morning is salvation. But that salvation being made alive, being raised up together, being able to have the opportunity to sit together is only found in Christ. Look in verse 7. You're going to see it again. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in kindness toward us. Where? Where is God's kindness? Where is God's grace? Where are the exceeding riches of God's grace? They are only found in Christ Jesus. How many times have we seen that in this passage? How many times does God have to lay it out for us that, folks, here's the offer. The offer is unity with God. And this rich offer, he's telling us exactly where to find it. He's telling us exactly where to go that this offer is in Christ Jesus. Now, what does God want to do? Drop down to verse 13. What does God want to do with you? He wants to save you in Christ, but what does that involve in verse 13? But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near. Did you ever have one of those days? Maybe it was one of those days at school where you just couldn't wait to get home. Sit down next to your mom and sit down next to your dad and just let them put their arm around you. You have, ever have one of those days? You ever have one of those days at work? You just want to get home. You just want to sit down next to your husband, next to your wife. You just want, why? Because there is, there's peace there. There's protection there. God says, I want to bring you near unto me. Look in verse 14. He himself is our peace. God wants you to have peace. And he made both one. He's broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one, two man, uh, one man from the two, and thus making peace. God's offer for you is to bring you close. God's offer for you is to give you peace. God's offer for you in verse 16 is to make you one in His body. God's offer for you in verse 16 is to put to death the enmity that exists between you and God. God's offer for you in verse 18 is that you might have access unto the Father. Do you have access unto the President of the United States? Do you have that kind of access? Well, you might be able to write him a letter. You might be able to send him an email. You got any guarantee that that's going to get to the president? Could you call him on the phone? Do you, do you know the number for the red line? Could you call him on the phone and say, hey, Mr. President, how you doing today? Would he know your voice if you called him? You don't have access to the president. He's got security all around him to make sure you don't have access to the president, the God of heaven wants to give you access to Him. 
No security force to keep you away. No, re- no trick number that you've got to figure out. No send an email and wonder if it's going to get bounced back or not. He wants to give you open access to Him so that you can have unity with Him. You go down to verse 19. What does God's offer to us in verse 19? He wants to make us fellow citizens. He wants to make us fellow citizens in His kingdom. God has a kingdom that He wants you to be in. He wants you to be a citizen of His kingdom, but even better than that, and even more, and, and, and it's the same thing, but it's, it's just so much more, to, to a human, even more meaningful. He wants to make you a member of His family. Look at the end of verse 19. To make you a member of the household, the family of God. A moment ago, a moment ago we had on the screen Man's self-inflicted state of separation. On the, a moment ago, we had on the screen a condition that was described as being dead in trespasses. A description of God that's described in this passage as being without Christ, being without God, being far off, being an enemy of God. And we look at that list and we say, I don't want a single part of it. There's not anything on that list that I want. There's not anything that, well, I can't stand that, but I can deal with this. I can't deal with any of that list. But I want you to look at this list. Same chapter, same God, now offering unto us unity. And I want you to look at this list and say, which one of these do you want? Which one of these would you like to have? Salvation from every sin. Would you like to have that? Being brought near unto God. Would you like that? Being able to have peace with God. Would you like that? Being able to be in the family of God. You look at this list. I want every single one of them. There's not one on here that I would say, well, you know, I could probably do without that. I want God's offer to me to be united with Him. And I ask you this morning, do you have uninhibited, do you have complete unity with God without anything standing in your way? Do you have a relationship with God this morning that has no barriers to it, that has no separation to it? I want you to go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and see that God makes us this offer, this rich offer. But when you look in verse 4, you begin to read about the, the love of God. And Kevin, we sang about it. And, and the song that we sang right before the lesson, it's amazing how that song is not only tied to the previous lesson, Come let us, that's what we talked about at the 9 o'clock hour, come let us unite together. But what did the chorus of that song say? God is love. What happens in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4? You see the greatness of God's love overflowing in His mercy for us. When you read this passage We read in verse 4 about God being rich in mercy. We read in verse 4 about God's great love. We read in verse 5 that God, but that by grace you have been saved. We read in verse 8, by grace you have been saved. I believe it was Brother Tom Holland who used to talk about grace and mercy. And for us, sometimes we think about grace and mercy, and that you know they're kind of the same thing. And, And in many ways they mean the same thing, but how How can we understand the difference between God's grace and God's mercy? I grew up uh, uh, with the definition of grace being unmerited favor. That was just the memorized definition. If you were taught in Bible class, what's grace? Unmerited favor. I think I was about 30-something years old before I ever learned what that meant. Uh, Exaggeration just a little bit. But, you know, unmerited favor, what does that mean? God's grace is that I receive from God what I don't deserve. For by grace you have been saved. 
I get what I don't deserve. God's mercy is that I don't receive what I do deserve. God, through the richness of His love, is offering you a gift, His grace, that you don't deserve. And He's willing to take away that which you do deserve. And He's ready to save you. And when you read Ephesians chapter 2, it's as if you are looking through God's, through God's plan to save man, and God had to find someone. God had to find someone who could bring man back to that perfect relationship with Him. But you know, an angel couldn't do it. An angel could not have saved man. God, an angel could. Now, an angel might know the things of God, but he's not God. An angel knows nothing about the struggles or the weaknesses or the temptations of man. He hasn't been a man. He can't, he can't save us. When God went looking for someone to save us, he didn't choose just a man. I've known some outstanding men in my day. My grandfather is probably the best man I've ever known. My Aunt Becky would probably agree with that. Probably the best man I've ever known. I don't know a single I think Becky might. I don't know a single mistake he ever made. I don't know a single thing he ever did wrong. I could not name a single solitary sin that my grandfather ever committed. Loved that man. But God did not choose my grandfather to save me. Because even my grandfather had his weaknesses. Even my grandfather had made mistakes. Wonderful of a man as he was. When God got ready to save us from our sins, He chose His own Son to save us. He sent His own Son to this earth to become the sacrifice for our sins. And, and what a perfect, marvelous plan it was. Because here you have the Son of God. You have God Himself. Colossians 2 says He had the fullness of deity, the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He's God. He, be, he, he became man, but it, and He was the Word in flesh. He was still God. And yet the Bible also calls Him the Son of Man. He was, and we can't figure this out, He was 100% God, but at the same time, He was 100% man. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He became as one of us. He had to, the end of Hebrews chapter 2 says, He had to be made like His brethren. That statement has always uh, ju just taken me aback. What do you mean He had to be made like His brethren? In order to save us. In order to be our sympathetic high priest. In order to know what we go through, He had to be made like us. God wants so much for us to be united with Him that He sent His Son. And salvation is only possible. This unity of God is only possible. Look in verse 18, Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 18. For through Him, Jesus is the only vehicle through which we can be saved. He's the one who said that... that, that uh, that no one can come unto the Father but by me in John chapter 14 and verse 6. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other. The only way to have unity with God is through Christ. But go back and look in verse, in verse 13, that the only way that unity with God is made possible is not just through Christ, but it's through the death of Christ in verse 13. I cannot be saved 
without the death of Christ. But it's not just that He died for me. What does verse 13 say? That it is, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It is not just that Jesus died a vicarious death for me, dying in my place. It is that Jesus died a violent death. It's not just that He died. It's that His death required a shedding of blood. That's how I'm saved. That's how I'm brought into unity with God. But it goes even more than that. It's not just a vicarious death. It was not just a violent death, but drop down to verse 16, where it says that He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. It was not just that Jesus died for me in order that I might have unity with God. It was not just that Jesus shed His blood in a violent manner in order that I might have unity with God. It is that Jesus, Galatians 3 and verse 13, it is that Jesus became a curse for me in order that I might have unity with God. He died the vicious death of the cross reserved for the worst of criminals and the worthless of slaves. He died that for me. He died that for you. Because God wants us to have unity with Him. How much do we want to have unity with God? How much do we think about our relationship with God? God thought it was the most important thing ever. He thought it was the most valuable thing ever. And He gave His own Son. He gave His own Son to shed His blood upon that cross in order that we might be saved. Now notice what verse 16 says. That He might reconcile them both to God in one body. Where is man saved? Where does man come to have unity with God? What does the Bible say? The Bible says that God reconciled, made unity, brought back to Him mankind. And where did God bring them back to Him? In one body. You go back to chapter 1, and what's the body in verses 22 and 23? It's the church. Where did God intend for man to be reconciled unto Him? In the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? You, put it in, you let the Bible define it. It is the church of Christ. Not, not, not some building that's got that name on a sign out front. but the church that Jesus shed His blood to purchase on that cross. When we read Ephesians chapter 2, we cannot be saved without Christ. We cannot have unity with God without His death, without His blood, and without the cross of Jesus. But in this same context, as emphatically stated as the necessity of Christ's death on the cross, is my place in His body. And with the beauty of this, look at the word body in verse 16. He reconciled them to His body in verse 16. Down in verse 19, that we might be citizens. What citizens? But of the kingdom. And then at the end of verse 19, members of the household of God. You have right here in this little section of Scripture a number of metaphors, a number of words that are used to describe what the church is. The church of Christ is the body of Christ, is the kingdom of Christ, is the family of Christ. All of those are described here. And God says in order to have unity with Him, I must be in His church. Are you in His church? Are you a part of His body? Are you in His kingdom? Are you in His family? The Bible says that is the only place that you can have unity with God. And so as we close this morning, we have looked at God's rich offer of unity. 
Salvation in Christ, being brought near. We have looked at God's great love that gave His own Son. He wanted us to be united with Him so much that He gave His own Son. God so loved you and me. But what's interesting is that God is the one who has done so much work in order for us to be saved. It's an interesting discussion today about the difference between faith and works and how individuals don't want salvation to be by works. They want it to be by faith alone. And so they, they misuse passages and separate those two concepts, faith and works, as far apart from each other as they possibly can. And yet God is the one who puts them together. There's an, there's an expression in the Bible that says, what God has joined together... Let not man put asunder. Now the application of that is to marriage, husband and wife. But if God has joined faith and works together, who is man to come along and put those two things asunder and separate from each other? But in order for you to be united with God, do you know that God is the one who has done so much of the work? God is the one who has enabled us to have that enmity put to an end. God is the one who has enabled us to have a relationship established with Him again. God is the one who has presented unto you this great opportunity to be united with Him. And what He extends to you, what He extends to me, what He extends to all of mankind, is what He wants us to do in order to have that unity. God offers His unity to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, to those who are penitent, repent, and turn away from that sin, and those who are baptized into Christ. Is baptism, is baptism all that important? When we talk about having unity with God, does baptism have anything to do with that? Can I have unity with God and not have been baptized? The Bible says that if I want this enmity put away, what is this enmity? What is the enmity between me and God? It is my sin. My sin makes me an enemy of God. How do I remove that sin? In Acts chapter 2, what did Peter tell them to do? Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why should they do that? For the remission of the enmity that is there between you and God. The purpose of New Testament baptism is for the remission of sins. And when someone is baptized into Christ and all of their sins are removed, they are now in a unified relationship with God. Do you have that kind of relationship? Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? It's not just that baptism washes away our sins. It is that baptism puts us into a right relationship with God. That self-inflicted state of separation is not a right relationship with God. I can have unity with God, but it only comes through baptism. Baptism is what gives me a new relationship with God. In Matthew chapter 28, in the Great Commission, Jesus told them, go, and, go, therefore, and, uh, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, baptizing them in the old American standard, had the preposition into. We have the, most translations today have the word in. The old SV had the preposition into. It's not the word in that's in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's talking about doing it by his authority. But in Matthew 28 and verse 19, it is baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the emphasis of that word in two is a brand new relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that I did not have before I was baptized. But upon my penitent 
and faithful and, and heart full of faith, when I'm baptized, I enter into a new relationship. A relationship where I am now one with God. Where I am now in unity, unified with God. And when I am baptized into Christ, there and only then, am I baptized into His death where His blood can wash away my sins. Have you ever done that? The song we're going to sing says there is power in the blood. Power is in the blood to wash away your sins. And Romans chapter 6 says that you come into contact with that blood when you are baptized into His death. And when you're baptized into His death, His blood washes away your sins. That enmity is gone and you enter a new relationship with Him. United with God. And what does He want you to do? I know that many of you have already done that. What does He want you to do when you've been baptized? What does He want you to do when you are now in a new relationship with God? He, if you want to know what unity with God is, it is loving what God loves. It's loving who God loves. It is thinking what God thinks. It is speaking what God speaks. It is wanting what God wants. Do you want what God wants? God wants you to have a relationship with Him. And if you're not in that kind of a relationship this morning, we call upon you. If you think this is the time, we're going to sing to encourage you. You can come this day, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or if you as a child of God need the prayers of this church, if this church can help you in any way, why don't you come right now as together we stand and sing.